factors that are managed under individual improved technologies or practices because it's disaggregated by technology type. Um, and again, it is also measuring the number of hectares um, that are being managed by both male and female farmers um, and um, that are, are also applying improved technologies. And lastly, it's also measuring the number of hectares managed with an improved technology or practice for the first time. And this is sort of a, a, a big deal, this first time. Um, going back to some of Brett's discussion the other day about um, the time frame involved with adoption. The third indicator uh, is really about groups. So it's very similar to the first indicator, which is really only measuring individuals. Um, and the third indicator is really focusing on groups um, in terms of uh, groups that are uh, applying improved technology. It's disaggregated in a similar way um, to the number of farmers. So I just want to sort of highlight a couple of different things. Um, there is this idea of applied versus adoption. And we've talked mostly about adoption over the past few days. Um, adoption is really a longer term process, again, thinking back to some of Brett's timelines that he had there. And this indicator is really focusing on um, sort of that first step that farmers and others might be taking in terms of taking a risk and actually bringing on a new technology into their um, agricultural systems. Um, but the, the, one of the disaggregates, so there's the new part of the disaggregate, there's also the continuing, which looks at whether or not the farmer is applying it in that reporting year and they had also applied it in the previous year. So there is some sort of indication of adoption, although over a, a five-year project, it would be pretty hard to say whether a farmer has actually fully adopted an improved technology or practice. Rather, that might be something that's better measured several years post-project when um, any subsidies that might have been part of the project have been removed. And it really indicates whether or not farmers learned the, the, these technologies and practices and then took it upon themselves to really continue them in a long-term sense. Um, so I just wanted to sort of highlight that these indicators are really about application and, and are used sort of as proxies for adoption. Um, let's see. Oh, I do want to mention under um, the number of hectares, under improved technologies or management practices, this is a land-based uh, indicator. So if your project is really about um, maybe some livestock practices or fishing, um, that can't really be measured in terms of hectares, then you wouldn't be using this indicator. It can't really be captured here. So this is an indicator that is very specific to land-based um, technologies and management practices. And we'll see that a little bit better. It's sort of a subset of the, the larger beneficiary universe, if you will, uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, there is a question about what is an improved technology. I heard that uh, in a couple of discussions over the past few days, and it is up to missions and your partners in developing your scaling plans to sort of figure out which technologies and practices um, make the most sense in terms of scaling up. And those would be the only ones that you would be reporting on. Uh, and then there is the issue of technology packages. Um, a number of technologies, conservation agriculture, integrated pest management, are really sort of packages of individual technologies um, that can be applied in different combinations. And um, it, it is a good thing for missions to think about actually tracking those individual technologies, even though they're offering it as a package. Um, because there is this sense of uh, what does application mean? If you're using an improved seed variety, but you're not actually planting it at the recommended planting density or spacing, have you really applied that technology? And those are sort of difficult things in terms of measure uh, monitoring and evaluation, but they're sort of critical to really being able to determine, you know, whether you're hitting your goals or not, whether farmers are actually taking up the, the technology as it is intended and reaping the benefits um, that the technology provides through its proper application. So those are going to all be things that you'll need to consider. Um, all three of these indicators are disaggregated by new and continuing, which I sort of talked about. This is about the first time application of an improved technology or practice through time versus um, sort of in that reporting year they're applying it, but they'd also applied it the previous year. So they're talking about two consecutive years of application. Let's see. So the last thing to just briefly highlight is this, as a result of U.S. government assistance, 
um, we are talking about the, the improved technologies and practices that your projects are actually promoting, not just those that a farmer might be taking up on their own. So um, I want to just sort of highlight that really quickly, too. Um, and then we want to talk just a little bit about this direct beneficiary thing, because all of these indicators are geared towards measuring uh, impacts on direct beneficiaries. Um, so direct beneficiaries are those that receive significant direct contact with an activity, right? Um, it does include sort of cascades or peer-to-peer -peer training, training of trainers, those sorts of things. Um, the thing to think about here is whether or not the project has a specified methodology or process um, that involves the, the sort of cascade training that can happen. Everybody in that, that cascade would be considered a direct beneficiary. So if you're doing training of trainers, uh, you're training trainers who are then going to be training farmers, even though um, there's maybe no direct, direct contact with those farmers who are going to be trained, they are direct beneficiaries or targeted beneficiaries of your training activity. So they would, you would want to be uh, including them. So, so here we have here, what to think about um, in, in terms of deciding whether you're looking at direct or indirect beneficiaries. It's the service delivery mechanism um, that's important, right? Is it your intent to actually get your message all the way down to the farmers, even if you're not directly uh, training them um, directly, but rather through some sort of cascade or facilitated types of training? process um, and thinking about being held accountable for those changes. So um, if your ultimate goal is behavior change in farmers, um, that's what you want to be accountable for. That's where you want to be looking at the impact of your intervention. So you want to have some mechanism through which you're going to be able to give yourself credit essentially for making changes at that level. Um, okay. Oh, thought I get a blank. Okay, we're going to look at the beneficiary universe now, really quickly. Again, related to direct and indirect beneficiaries. So, this these two indicators, farmers and others, and number of organizations that are applying improved technology. Um, these are direct beneficiaries anywhere throughout the value chain. Again, this is not just about farmers. This includes individual processors, herders, fisher folk, etc. So this is sort of the broad grouping of direct beneficiaries that you might be dealing with. Um, the number of hectares that are under improved technologies is a subset of that. Again, this is really only dealing with, um, and notice here it says small boulder primary producers that are applying land-based technologies only. So um, the other day we saw some case studies that involve sort of large commercial farmers. Um, those guys could be included in the number of farmers indicator and their hectares could be, would not be included under the number of hectares because they're not smallholder primary producers. So there's some distinction happening here. Um, you can't use the number of farmers indicator and the number of hectares indicator to come up with a number of hectares per farmer because there are other types of direct beneficiaries that are included in this number of farmers and others indicators. So um, again, Sort of superficially, they look like just sort of broad level numbers indicators, but there, there is actually some depth to these things and some nuanced differences um, in terms of who they're actually targeting and who can be reported in these different indicators. Okay, so then um, those are sort of the three indicators that have been identified, um, but obviously, um, in, in, especially in terms of scaling up, there is this whole issue of indirect beneficiaries. There's a lot of impact that Feed the Future interventions are going to have on um, beneficiaries, on population groups outside of your direct beneficiaries. And um, this is a big gap in, in the current Feed the Future M&E plan. So you're not reporting on indirect or spread or zone level results. Um, and one of the options that's being proposed here is to actually add some of these types of indi that can, indicators that can capture this type of um, spread to the Feed the Future results framework. And this would be the person that you would want to send your comments to. Um, so again, I want to reiterate, this is a process. Um, Feed the Future M&E team recognizes there are these gaps in terms of the M&E system for scaling up. And they are very much looking forward to your input, particularly in how to deal with these types of issues, uh, where to get the data for this sort of stuff. In fact, um, 
uh, Jawus, I think that's, yeah, his tool um, sort of struck a chord with me in terms of potentially being useful for this type of thing, exactly collecting the data that would be used to um, look at the effect of the future investment. Um, Emily mentioned the learning agenda uh, and the number of questions that they're looking to um, provide evidence for or answers to. And this is just a really small list uh, sort of exemplifying what some of those questions are, particularly related to scaling up. Um, and we've talked about a number of these things over the past few days. What are the most binding constraints in promoting technology adoption um, and the most effective interventions for dealing with those constraints? Um, what are the characteristics of the most efficient, effective, and sustainable vehicles for promoting? Let's see, I've got to find where the rest of this is because it's. Um, Oh, here we go, for promoting adoption of innovation. So that would be technology practices, behaviors, and the fusion of these products and the new technologies among the poor, women, and other marginalized groups. Um, and then what, what have been the gender impacts of these specific um, technologies? And again, thinking back to those indicators and how they're disaggregated, there are gender disaggregates for all of these. So they're really trying to look at differential impacts of interventions on male and female farmers and other beneficiaries. And then uh, what are the trade-offs uh, resulting from the increased use of a specific technology in a way um, that farm labor and land and other factors are actually being used because there are always trade-offs. Um, again, this is just a small sampling of the sorts of questions um, that they're looking to um, provide some evidence for. And evidence comes from, at least some degree, from the impact evaluations. And these are just a few examples that are being provided in terms of upcoming impact evaluation, um, trying to get at the answers to some of these questions. Uh, another uh, urea deplacement technology in Liberia, uh, Julie mentioned the project in Bangladesh that had shown a real progress in that. Uh, E-verification and effective marketing of ag inputs in Uganda, looking at um, the impacts of adoption rates in agricultural productivity. And then in Mozambique, a mobile money technology project, um, looking at the impacts on how farmers store, save, and send money especially related to ag inputs and the impacts on their ability to overcome seasonal cash constraints. So um, hopefully uh, the stuff that comes out of these um, impact evaluations will help sort of at least begin to start filling the gap in some of the um, evidence-based uh, gaps that are still exist for Feed the Future. And I think this is the last one, touching really briefly on your scaling plan. Um, that they're really about uh, describing the how and, and from where and with what frequency and from whom uh, your, the missions will obtain data in order to monitor and annually report on the uptake of targeted technologies. Um, will this involve the use of existing M&E plans, drawing on those plans, or the creation of completely new ones? Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but I will talk about it a little bit more here. This additional, they need potentially for additional indicators and or custom indicators. And just going back to the Feed the Future indicators, they've identified those three, but there are um, 57 total Feed the Future um, indicators, many of which could also be used to help track the effects of scaling. Um, two in particular that come to mind are sort of the gross margin and incremental sales. Again, thinking back to that logical framework or the results framework, that more farmers that are applying improved technologies leads to more hectares being managed with improved technologies, which leads to increased productivity and sales, uh, and hopefully um, return to farmer. So that suite of four indicators really sort of gets to the core of feed the future interventions um, in terms of high level overarching goal. Um, and then custom indicators. Uh, in the process of putting together the guide, it became pretty obvious that people are intimidated by this list of, of indicators. There's a lot there to choose from, and there's a lot of flexibility to develop custom indicators that really get to the, the project level stories um, that are critical to project management um, that maybe don't need to be reported into FTFMS, but that are a critical part of um, your objectives. And so I just want to sort of reiterate that while there is this framework of these indicators that you can use, um, you should and can uh, create custom indicators to help tell your stories. And to that end, um, I'm just going to, these are the two websites. I think these are both available on AgriLinks, both for the handbook, which really gives definitions for all 57 uh, indicators under the Feed the Future uh, portfolio, 
and the Agricultural Indicators Guide, which really focuses on those four key ag indicators. Um, and I will be the first to admit it's a really hefty document. It takes a lot of time to get through, but there's a lot of really detailed information in there that can answer your very specific questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to end um, and pass it back to Julie.